John Denny, welcome to Succession Stories. Not only are you the first client that I've had on the show, but we're also going to dive into a topic that I don't talk about very often with my guests, which is looking forward as opposed to the rear view mirror. So thank you for the courage to come on the show and put yourself in the hot seat. Well, great to be here and I look forward to it and just be gentle on me. <laughs> of course. Be gentle. <laughs> You know, John, I know you well, but the we audience do doesn't know you. Today. <laughs> yeah, right. You got the memo. If, if people are watching us on YouTube, they're going to think that I invited you on the show to wear your red shirt. Had I known. We look good, though. We do with our red shirts on. That's right. We tell ourselves that. <laughs> red is a power, a power color. Ah. It is. Now, I know you well, but the audience doesn't know you yet. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your company? Thanks, and I'm happy to do so, Lori. I'm glad to be here. So I am the founder and uh, president CEO of Denny Civic Solutions, which is a Pittsburgh-based consulting company where we work around the issue. Uh, we work around advocacy for our clients, putting smart connections smart advocacy, smart messaging, and communication strategy to help advance good policy, both locally and at the state level. Our vision is to create change for the common good. Now, how did I get to this point in my life? Earlier in my career, I worked in campaign politics, I worked in philanthropy, I worked in nonprofit management and in the public sector. And about 12, 13 years ago, I thought I can take all those components together, mold them into a new company where actually we're working to do the kind of advocacy efforts that most clients don't always get when they just have a government relations firm or they've got a separate communications firm or, or what have you. We kind of combine it all into one in a new approach. That was one of the things that really impressed me when I met you about three-ish years ago, COVID. which was doing the math, COVID, right? Yeah, it was a crazy time. And I remember being really impressed, and I still am, to be hearing about all the services and the value you're providing to your clients with a really small team. It's a pretty small team. Yeah, and to the outside eye someone looking at your firm saying, oh, what they do kind of looks like a marketing services firm in terms of what you deliver and how you deliver it. But it's more than that. And as you said, it's the advocacy. And when we met, one of the things we talked about was putting together a plan, a strategic plan for the business that set a course. I think at the time we did a three-year plan, did we not? It was a three-year a three-year right. strategic plan which that set a course for growth. Again, which means it's time to restart it. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's just talk about that because A, small companies like yourself don't normally do that work. So it was really interesting to me as your strategic planning facilitator to work with you and your team on it. And now in hindsight, I, I would love to hear your reflections on how that process went and what it what it impact it has had in your business since? There are probably four or five key things that came out of the strategic planning process as I look back on it. Number one, we had a hard time clearly defining what we do and being able to articulate that. And frankly, we came up with our vision statement, which caught, captured everything we were trying to say in five or six simple words, making change for the common good. That set the stage for all of our work going forward, number one. Number two, we identified a number of services that we provide that are, I'm not sure this is the right word, but replicable. In other words, these are ones, these are services that we provide that we can have most of our employees be trained to do that uh, would also help take a load off of the other work that we do with clients being very creative in our approach and management of the projects. That was critical to us. Number three, we forgot about one big key element, sales. I mean, for the longest time, and still to this date, you know, as the head of the company, I tend to be the lead in all sales. But because we focused on the sales component of the strategy meeting, of the strategy plan, how you go about doing sales, how you market, 
we engaged with a, your recommendation, another company that led us through that process so that now everybody in the team is able to either promote our services in the correct way, uh, sell up on some of the clients, the other services we do, or simply get them more comfortable in doing um, uh, pitch sessions or as we call them, uh, informational sessions, just to kind of learn what a prospect may need and what we can offer. Yeah, the reflection of the team's reactions to not only where we are now, but if you can think back to, were there any objections or they were always bought into the process? I think... First of all, there was a fear factor, I think, when we started it, just before we started it. I can remember one of our employees saying, oh, my gosh, you're not going to make me be a salesman, are you? No, that's not what this is about. That's a component, but selling at the place, we're going to meet you where you are as an employee and find out how you can best help us on the sales. So there was an, there was probably with some a fear factor. Um, and then I would say throughout the process, there was a level of concern, which we managed now and mastered was how in the world are we going to implement everything that we've come up with? But we've designed a system where we literally have every two weeks, a strategy session with the team where we go through by category, by line item, what we've done, have we hit our market target? Does it still make sense? I mean, we found some things that we thought were absolutely critical at the time doesn't make sense where we are now. So we're able to adjust, but there was another fear factor of, are we going to be able to do it all? Yeah. Cause you're a small team and you're servicing clients. And I'm really proud for what you just said, that you've embraced the action oriented nature of a plan. It is, it, if you create a plan and you put it away on a shelf or in your Google Dropbox, whatever, and you never look at it again, what good is it? Exactly. So you could not only did it, but you've continued to, update you've continued to modify and execute which is which is huge we even make on our every on our bi-weekly calls we make a team member have to practice one of the sales pitches is the wrong word but uh, uh sales approach of what we do uh before the entire team and at first they were scared to death about it but now it's become a kind of an engaging fun part of our every uh, other week uh, session. Can you, if you were going to rewind and say, I wish we had a strategic plan, you know, years ago, could you say that it is something that other companies should be doing as well? Uh, absolutely. In fact, I thought we did have a strategic plan before we engaged with you, Lori. I mean, we uh, worked as a team and, well, let me put it this way. We Googled all the strategic planning processes to go through, which were helpful. But when we were leading ourselves through it, it just wasn't the same as having somebody who has gone through the, who is a professional at the strategic planning process uh, to uh, lead you through it. So we did have strategic plans that frankly weren't that good and we never really followed. Uh, until we engage with an outside company to help us think through a strategic plan. So regardless of one size, I think it's valuable. And the only thing I feel ashamed of is that I've realized it's not three and a half years almost, and we haven't started the new planning session, but I think we'll get into that. That's great. That's great. You have gotten a copy of my book and I know you've cracked it open. I know you've gotten through a couple of chapters. <laughs> I want to tie three chapters. That's awesome. And and you told me that your wife stole it from you. <laughs> Sorry. So my wife is part owner of the company. And so I brought this book home about really uh, transitioning or beginning the transitioning process from owning a company to life after owning the company. And I got through three chapters. She took the book from me and she started reading it uh, because she thinks it makes it, well, number one, I do too, but she was really interested in thinking through the process as part of the owner. So as soon as she's done, I'll go back to chapter four and uh, finish the uh, next, I, be I believe it's a 20 chapter book. It's around that. It's about 15. 15 chapters. 
finish it. But uh, we met, you and I, about uh, two and a half weeks ago. You asked me the question, so uh, what's in the future for me and Denny Civic Solutions? And I said, well, I haven't really thought about that. You know, I've got another five to six good years in me, five, six, seven good years. I'll think about what we do next or how we transition in. And at that point, you said, I wouldn't wait much longer because to get the maximum amount of what you have and what you want to get out of the company, regardless which direction you go, you know, find somebody else to run it, sell the company, or even just shut it down. You need to start planning that now. So that's where we are. Yeah. Finishing the book first. Finishing the book first. Well, so let's talk about business transition because the planning side for growth is where you and I have started. And that's important. And a number of things that you and the team have been working on will create value, such as the sales process and that you as one person are not the only person who knows the process and who interfaces with clients on prospects and so on. So we, you and I might have known that that was an underlying piece of what we were working on together for the plan, but your team didn't. They they still, they might not, they might not see it that way. And that's okay. The, the, the business transition side gives us more runway when we have more time to build value. So if we say, you know, really your clock probably started three years ago because you know you've been working on pieces to drive value in the business. So the sales piece is just one example and there are others, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, the context of if you want to have a transition in five to seven years, maybe we should just unpack that a little bit. Why did I say to you, you really should start now? And that's because of this issue. A lot of business owners get to the point where they think they can sell the company and it'll be attractive to whoever they assume is going to buy it. And then a couple of things can happen. One, the price that they get back is just way off from what they expected. Two, the intended buyer, many times it could be a family intention. I think I'll sell to family or transition to my family member, my son or daughter. They don't want it. And that also can happen with management where a management team member, it might be presumed to be a successor. And then that person is intimidated either financially or operationally to do so. And those are that's a big risk to find out at the last minute that our vision of what an exit might look like is not meeting our objectives. Well, what I liked about our meeting, one of the first things or one of my first takeaways was even thinking through or being aware of what are all the different options potentially from you know, family, from an outside buyer, from someone on the management team uh, taking over, from shutting it down and saying goodnight, everybody, uh, to that thinking through or first being aware that there are all these different options, which frankly, I wasn't even at that point, number one. Number two, regardless of which option, it seems to me that you don't pick that option right at the first start. You kind of go through a process And again, I've only gone through chapter four, but I think you go through a process. And as you're going through the process, you're kind of whittling down what might make the most sense. Is that correct? I think that's right. We start with your goals. What are your personal goals? What are, what's your vision for a, use the word exit, transition, you know, retirement, whatever word you want to use, where you are no longer in the business day to day. For some people, they just want to be chairman and put their feet up on the desk and have arm's length, and that's their vision, and they'll do that for a long time because they've hired in a CEO. Others say, I might recapitalize and bring in a minority investor or a majority investor. I have a client that just did that. Mm -hmm. They brought in a majority investor, and they're still in the business day-to-day as CEO. And others say, I want to sell outright. You know, so what role you want to have and the vision you want to have is I, you know, I want to put my feet up uh, in my RV. (laughs) You've told me you want to, you want to get an RV and you want to travel, right? The only one in my family who wants the RV. Nobody. (laughs) (laughs) So you might be alone in your RV. (laughs) Maybe the dog will come with me. 
<laughs> there's somebody that I know when he sold his company, he and his family, and I think at the time they had five kids and they were all probably middle school, not high school yet, and, and younger. And they moved to Australia and New Zealand and for a year drove an RV around and just had an amazing time. And that was his vision. So everybody's vision is different, right? But that's where we start is what are your personal goals? And tied to that are our financial goals. And then part of the understanding of your financial goals is what's the business value today? We need to baseline it so that we can establish if we have a gap. So we're just rough numbers. If you want to sell it for 2 million, but the business is worth a million, what are we going to do to close that gap? So how much time we have to work on that and close the gaps really important. So what are the value drivers in the business and what are the risks in the business? And you and I had started to talk about that with a business assessment and we had identified a few things. Again, the team might not have realized that that was the underlying foundation of why we were doing what we were doing. We right. were getting it to the point where uh, financially you wanted to hit a certain level. And from a process standpoint, there were pieces in the business that you didn't have before, which can help mitigate risk of transition. So that that's really important. And I think you haven't gotten to the chapter yet in the book, but it is one of my favorites, which is chapter six, which is who should own the company after you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important chapter. You hit on it. You know, what? who who should own the business after you could really vary by, by category, but it comes down to fit. And your firm has a very specific culture. Many companies do. Mm -hmm. And I hear it all the time on the show that people say that it, the sale didn't necessarily go to the highest offer. It went to the best fit. Exactly. How do you think about that? Well, I really think if you ask me what's most important to me in a transition, regardless whether it's somebody else, whether it's something outright, is for me, the this may sound altruistic, but the most important thing for me is to make sure that the team I currently have or whatever team I have at that point in time would be absolutely comfortable staying with the company under new leadership uh, or moving on, but not but not because of the new leadership. I want them to know that this is the same culture and they feel very comfortable because I think uh, based on surveys and based on annual reviews and just based on the chemistry, I think the team we have is not only a great team, but love the culture that we have here. So. To me, that's number one. So it that's is really important. Is there are there more? Uh, well, if I had to think through some other ones, just starting this process, which I wanted to come to a question for you on this as well, is number one is fit in the team. Number two is that the current and past clients that we have would see this not as a radical change in the way we approach our work but actually as either a continuation or an enhancement of it. Well, one of the things that we do, Lori, is we, we become good, bad, or indifferent, but I think it's good. We become actually part of the client where we're actually engaged with them in helping to implement whatever the plan is that we develop together. It's not the kind of thing where we develop a plan and say, let's check in next month. We are working with them on a weekly basis making sure that everything that we put together, we're implementing it. And often we're doing the implementing, not on their behalf, but with them. And so I want them to know that that's going to stay the same because I, I think in order to really have a maximum impact and understand what you're doing, you got to have a close working relationship with the client. At least that's my sense. Yeah, absolutely. You have a question for me? I do. So let's say we're starting right now. we got five to seven years. Right now, what's one of the first things you would say that you and I would start to work on in this transition? The very first thing you and I would do is go through a personal readiness assessment and talk about your identity, the roles that you have today, the people who you identify closely with, whether it's family and or work and those relationships, how you want to see those relationships uh, over time where you would like to spend more time if you weren't day-to-day -day in the business 
see how that all ties together? It's, it's for some people, their social network is their company. Correct. For you, that's not necessarily a case, but for others it is. So that's where I typically start. And it's the visioning part. If we start to create a vision of what we might do next, what happens? We get excited about that, right? right? We can we call these the pull factors. So the the mindset that we have about personal transition is where I start because it also really helps me get to know where you are right now and meet you where you are, to use your words. That's what I like to do. I think it's really important. And that's why it's one of the first chapters in the book. It's that mindset exercise and it's it's the roles that you play and all of those things. And we go pretty deep on that. I, this is a little bit sad, but I had a client who passed away and I found out after the funeral and um, I reread all of my notes and I, I didn't know him very well, but I read my notes from when I did this initial onboarding and, and go through this, like it's the pre, the pre-score, which is a personal readiness assessment. And through those notes, I knew his intentions mm -hmm. and his widow wanted to know what his intentions were. She didn't know. Mm. And I knew. And I, of course I shared that with her, but um, you know, that's the thing. It's like, sometimes we don't have these conversations with the people we care about, or if we do have them and it's not written down and someone passes away, such as my client, then your loved ones are left in a little bit in the lurch and they're in mourning. So it's very complicated. So not only are we doing this work because we are anticipating a five to seven year transition in the future, maybe, you know, a sale, a sale to someone, presumably. Um, but also along the way is we need to mitigate risk. And for many owners, they don't have business continuity plans in place. Mm. And this is another thing. I didn't go on uh, very deep in the book, but just to talk about it and tee it up is with clients, I want to understand a lot of things about where are we today from the business and what some of the risks are. And if the business has some risks like this, or if something happened to the owner and the owner cares a lot about its employees, and I know you do, uh, what would happen if, what would happen if you were no longer able to serve? And that is uh, something that I also work on with clients. Well, I'm anxious to get started now, knowing that I've got to get it started five or seven years in advance, because before you know it, it's going to be on top of me. And uh, I can't even believe we're almost through the summer of this year. So I look forward to it. And I appreciate the time to spend with you on this uh, podcast. And and uh, we will uh, get to work on my transition. <laughs> well, I'm excited to work with you, John. And just to close out the episode, I, I know you're a fan of the show Succession and mm -hmm. yeah, where you, where you. How could they pick Tom? <laughs> of all the they... people, Tom. Yeah, Tom. I know. Wasn't the best <laughs> choice. <laughs> Do you think Succession is a taboo topic? I don't know if it's a taboo topic. I think it's something we just don't, we either don't think about or we don't allow ourselves to think about it. And if that, and if it's not allowing ourselves to think about it, then maybe that is a taboo in a way. I know, like, for example, people won't even think about what they're going to do, you know, uh, or plan for the inevitable. Uh, and how many times in families do we see that happen that all of a sudden you're in a crisis situation with an in-law or a parent and you're thinking, why didn't we plan in advance? Let me tell you, my wife has already bought my tombstone and you know what it says? <laughs> I told you I was sick. <laughs> so... You know, I think that uh, you need to talk about these issues and get get a plan put in place. Yeah, that's awesome. John, thank you so much for coming on Succession Stories today, sharing your experience and talking about the things that maybe we don't talk about enough so that people aren't fearful of what's to come and they're more part of the process. My pleasure. Thank you so much. If people want to learn more about you and Denny Civic Solutions, what's a good way to get in touch with you? They can either check us out on our website, dennycivicsolutions.com and register for our newsletter to come out or feel free to give me a call at 412-551-1770. Thanks again, John. And to our listeners, be sure to follow Succession Stories in your favorite podcast player and YouTube and leave us a review. 
five stars helps us get the show discovered. To learn more about maximizing the value of your business and planning for your transition, sign up for a newsletter and book a complimentary call with me at the businesstransitionsherpa.com. Join us next time on Succession Stories for more insights from transition to transaction.